My name is Zainab Shahid. I'm one of the Transplant Infectious Diseases um, Medical Directors at the Levine Cancer Institute. Uh, my specialty within infectious diseases is uh, specifically towards immunocompromised host um, and their infections. What is a virus? Virus is a um, one of the uh, micro microbes which are present in the environment. Their structure is very small than a bacteria, and they are different um, when they get inside the body. They attack the body differently than a bacteria. Viruses can live within us, and we won't know for all our lives. Some of the viruses get integrated to our chromosomes. We are exposed from the environment, from the other um, hosts, which are humans and others, to different viruses all through our life. Some of them cause infections right away. Others cause an infection and stay dormant in our body for some time. Others are with us for all of our lives. Um, so it's one of the many smart creatures that are created with different varieties of um, forms and shapes. What is a coronavirus? Is COVID-19 the only one? Coronavirus is a special class of viruses and the current um, pandemic is with coronavirus 2. We are, our common cold that we see during the year round is also a coronavirus. So there are many different kinds of coronaviruses. There are four different kinds of human coronaviruses. And that means that the normal host is human. The peculiar thing about um, coronaviruses that have caused illness to the humans is because they're not human coronaviruses, they're animal coronaviruses, such as SARS. And so the current coronavirus, CoV-19, which is the disease caused by SARS-CoV-2, which is the name of the virus, is caused by a peculiar animal type of coronavirus that somehow find it, you know, as you know how, but they find they're found their way to the human body. How is the coronavirus SARS-CoV-2 transmitted from one person to the other? The virus SARS-CoV-2 is being transmitted from direct contact with a sick person. Sometimes when we are getting sick, we may not report any symptoms. And the peculiar thing about a viral infection, specifically COVID-19, is that we may not be symptomatic at all and may still have the virus. So it's human to human transmission at this time. It is usually the cough or the bodily respiratory secretions that transmit from one person to another. Um, mostly it's a droplet, but sometimes the virus is spread in, into the air and can be inhaled. That's called aerosolization of a virus. Some, there are early reports that it may also be aerosolized like TB. So that's why the, the, the discussion of N95 is occurring. We do know that the virus is also secreted in the stool. Whether it is fecal oral transmission, that is through the mouth, we do not know that yet. And um, whether it is transmitted through blood, that is also not known. So basically, most commonly, direct contact with an infected human being. What is community transmission? So when we try to figure out epidemiologically where the virus is coming from, it was related to travel, meaning in my community, there is nobody with virus. So somebody who came from outside brought the virus to us. But once again, that travel changes quite rapidly if person within the community start to give it to each other. So right now we're in a community transmission situation. That person who never traveled anywhere got the infection from somebody else so, and gave it to somebody else. So we're spreading within our community without traveling in and outside of the community. Why is this virus causing a pandemic when other viruses have not? The human body has never seen this virus and there 
it's a huge so you know we have earned our right to live on earth because we have seen our our mankind has seen so many viruses gone through so many pandemics and that immunity is passed on is built in this this particular virus our body has never seen and so it when the body receives this virus it is responding with is such a strong immune response that the body collapses and the virus is clever enough where it can attack trans in many different ways meaning it can come from direct contact meaning it can direct from aerosolized so it's a very highly transmissible virus and it is attacking a host that has never seen the virus the number that is thrown out there for every one infected person, they will infect up to four people around them. So the infectivity rate, the infection rate, or what we call attack rate is very high. Can you spread it when you're not symptomatic? That's correct. What are the symptoms of COVID-19? Most of the common symptoms that have been described um, specifically with COVID-19 is fever along with a cough and shortness of breath. These are the major studies coming up from China and Italy. These are the major presenting symptoms. Some of the other symptoms that have been associated is also a, less commonly, is a vague body ache with sometimes GI symptoms associated with respiratory symptoms as well. So cough and then exposure to somebody who's known to have COVID is a huge risk factor, knowing that the virus can infect very easily. So having an exposure, somebody's sick around you, you develop these symptoms, um, seek medical help. Is there a specific type of cough to look out for? It is allergy season. So usually the allergy season is associated with a lot of sinus symptoms and a post-nasal drip and runny eyes. This is mostly a dry cough and um, slightly different from the allergies because the other symptoms associated with allergies are not seen with COVID-19. How high of a fever should I look out for? Fevers have been variable. Um, some people would have very mild, low grade temperature. Others would have a very high temperature. And so obviously it would vary. People who would end up being in the hospital, the ones that I see are gonna be much sicker with much higher fever. So the fever would be above your body temperature. You would know you would have a fever, but more than 100.4 would be sort of a red flag that, hey, this is officially in fever. Do I have other symptoms? Am I coughing? Am I have short of breath? That should point towards COVID-19 infection. I have some of these symptoms and think I might have it. What should I do next? I would say that seek medical attention. When I say just call, do not, I would recommend if you're not severely ill, I would prefer that you do not go to a medical facility per se. So if you are mildly sick, stay home. Your healthcare providers are available for you via phone. Um, there are virtual visits that are being offered to provide support and guidance, but staying home, hydrating yourself, supporting yourself with um, uh, antipyretics such as Tylenol would be the first thing. Um, if somebody is wanting to get testing done, testing is available based on the community that you're living in. But the guidance is that you stay away from a medical facility as much as possible um, if you're not too sick. Um, and obviously, um, practice caution so that you do not infect people within your house, within your community. Um, and if you are working in a workplace, um, so be, be mindful of that. So staying home right now and seeking help via ways where you don't have to physically be there if you have any questions is the right way to go right now. I'm a cancer patient. Should I reach out to my primary care provider or my oncologist before treatment for COVID-19? If you are in treatment, I would reach out to the oncologist um, and the primary care. The, all the cancer centers um, you know, are very much wired and very much 
um, want to know. Oncology, you know, as you know, the, uh, the myeloma docs want to know if you're ill only because the myeloma patient are at increased risk of infection, not only because of their underlying myeloma, but because of the, some of the therapies that might be receiving. So let your provider know. They will guide you. They will probably ask you to stay home, but it would be important to let your oncologist know because they may want to break in therapy. They may want to do something different in your treatment plan if you're currently receiving chemotherapy. So please do reach out to them as well. It would be very important. What percentage of people with COVID-19 develop mild or severe symptoms? If I'm addressing a community where most of the folks are in uh, with have underlying cancer, please note that the data about can oncology patients and hematology patients is not very well known. Um, there is the fever is the predominant um, symptom, however, know that in certain studies that have been published, fever developed later on during the course of the illness rather than um, the very first symptom. Cough came on first. So the absence of fever, especially when you're receiving immunotherapy or chemotherapy, is not a rule out for the COVID-19 infection. Can you have the virus but get tested too early for it to show on the test? Yes, that's a very good question. That points towards the variability in the incubation period. If you got exposed to somebody, for example, yesterday and you want to get tested today, that test is not going to explain the true picture. In this scenario, you will still be in the incubation period and the infection can occur seven to 10 days after. Sometimes it has been in certain studies have been prolonged till 21 days. So, um, so I prefer the patients are not getting tested when they're asymptomatic because um, that would not be a true picture for tomorrow. Um, and so also we know once we talk about the percentage of patients per, to your uh, previous question, we know that the variability can be up to 70 to 80% of the patients develop with fever. So they would have some symptoms. The fever is not going to be the primary symptom, but I would recommend, unless we're in a surveillance study, don't get tested if you don't have any symptoms. What is the mortality rate of COVID-19? The mortality rate has been pretty much variable between different age groups. We know that the mortality in um, the Chinese um, uh, case studies or in China was anywhere between four to five percent. Now when we moved to Italy, the mortality was up to seven to eight percent because the population of Italy is mostly older and the older people were affected. The mortality in kids was zero in certain studies. So we know that the mortality depends on the age bracket that one is in. Overall mortality that has been described is 1%. But I do think that age becomes thus far a very important factor to assess the risk of infection. Does testing affect the mortality rate? It sure. would be interesting if we had the availability of testing, obviously the mortality is going to go down because now you're capturing patients who are symptomatic but aren't sick enough. In areas where they are not testing, the mortality looks much higher because you are only testing a few people and many of those are dying. So it, we have to almost always take in context, uh, context the practices of testing in the given area. What are ways I can decrease my exposure to the COVID-19 causing virus? There are certain lifestyles and there are certain um, um, uh, practices that I would point towards. The lifestyle would be, I would point towards two. Everybody knows about social distancing, very important. It is very important for us to avoid going to our neighbor's house, saying hi to people that we know, even we want to hug them, we want to get a, um, you know, kiss our um, 
be relatives that we haven't met. So social distancing, try to stay in the house and avoid social situations where you have to interact would not only be preventing yourself, but also doing a huge favor to the community. The other practice is medical distancing. That's a term that we are using so that the patients, as much as possible, obviously there are limitations in cancer patients, they, they can stay away from a healthcare setting. This is also to prevent exposure in areas where we don't have a lot of control um, for social distancing in a clinic situation, in an infusion center. So it becomes important the medical distancing, if your health allows it, and social distancing. And in terms of trying to prevent contact once you are in a given area, uh, making sure that your mouth is covered, um, um, if you are in contact with a situation where there are potentially sick people, and hand hygiene. We know that it can live on surfaces for many days, so touching things. It is very important every time you come inside the house, wash your hands with soap and water for a good 20 seconds. And that 20 second is actually washing hands, not just the whole process. It's actually rubbing your hands with soap and water. So hand hygiene, making sure the surfaces are clean, protecting your airways if you're in a situation you're possibly exposed to infected people would be very important. Should I wear a mask if I need to go out? So yes, so it is very important. The, the usage of mask would not only depend on your immuno, uh, immunocompromised state, everybody's gonna be different. Some people are gonna be neutropenic, others are not gonna be neutropenic. Some people are going to have community spread in the community, others may not. So it not only depends on your own current immune system, but also what is the um, level of community spread. So um, I would say that hand hygiene and covering your mouth and nose is advisable if you are immunocompromised uh, and if there is community spread. Do I need to sanitize my groceries? We do know that if somebody was sick around the, the groceries that you bought and potentially contaminated your groceries, we do know that the, uh, it can live into, onto plastic-like surfaces for up to three days. So again, very important to be able to wash your hands, um, um, making sure you dispose of, dispose of it carefully, um, the cardboards and the plastics that could have, you could have utilized in a contaminated potentially contaminated area. And as far as going to infusion and appointments, every institution is going to be implementing their policies. Um, there are patients who are going to be screened at the door so that potentially there is no interaction between a uh, um, sick patient and an ill, um, and sick patient means a patient potentially infect, um, in sick with COVID-19 and others. So there is that protection, but again, watching, uh, covering your face if indicated, washing your hands, keeping the distance are still some practices that we can employ in the medical settings as well. Should I get food and medicine delivered? I completely agree. Think about the, uh, the medications that can be delivered. Think about the groceries if they can be delivered. Be mindful that if somebody was um, sick was um, handling your grocery or your medication, the surfaces can be contaminated. Um, so wash your hands. Um, any way, any modalities that you can use to avoid to get out, especially in a community spread setting, it would be very important. I'm in Charlotte, North Carolina. Um, there is mandatory stay-at-home order in our county starting today. So re reach out to the local community that you're in um, to figure out the spread, but anything you can do to avoid potential exposure would go a long way. Does gargling with antiseptic help? Do zinc lozenges have any benefit? There's this um, um, report that came out that people who did Listerine goggles, they had a decreased viral load. I don't think it has an antiviral activity. I think it could it, could it decrease the viral load in a given specimen for that particular um, study? It may have, 
but I believe that normal hygiene that you do, I would just employ that. Um, I do not know what if I can scientifically say that that's going to prevent an infection. If you're immunocompromised and someone in your family needs to go to work, what precautions can you take to stop the virus from coming inside the house? The practice has to be remember the fomites and remember that your body can carry your your uh, clothing, your bag, your um, anything that you carry can have um, carry the virus on the surface. So the way I I personally do it in my house, my work shoes are different than my um, shoes that are entered within the house. No shoes inside the house. Review all the things that you, be mindful of everything that you carry to work. It could be a key, it could be a cell phone, it could be your laptop, it could be your bag, that, that went out and came in. It could be your clothing. Um, as you can see, I'm wearing scrubs. We're not allowed to wear white coats. So anything that can carry the virus on its surface, that could be a body, clothing, plastic, anything, shoes, get rid of it. Um, I don't wear um, these clothes to the house. I take a shower. That's the first thing that I do when I enter the house. Then I see anybody's face in the house. So these are practices that you can do to prevent virus from coming inside the house because we do know that it lives on the surfaces. What is viral load and how does it affect your level of risk? Viral load means the quantity of the virus in, in any given specimen. Uh, which specimen could be your sputum, could be blood, could be urine. The study that I was that was pointed out, the gargles, the Listerine gargles, showed that there was decreased number of virus in the uh, the the oral specimen, but it wasn't negative. So that's what I was trying. The amount of virus could have been decreased, but it's not the it's it's not the um, absence of virus was there. So I, that's what I was referring to. And then there is one study, it, it's interesting you brought that uh, viral mode in, that some study, today's study came out actually yesterday regarding the amount of virus could be the same in symptomatic people or asymptomatic people who are infected. So what I'm trying to say is that a, a person can potentially, again, infect even if they're asymptomatic. So again, it's important social distancing because the virus in quantities could be as much in your body if you're asymptomatic, if, even if you were symptomatic. Is it safe to order takeout food? I have been cautious about it because again, it's handling of the food. Um, the person, so anything which is heated, freshly cooked, warm food is fine. Uh, but again, how the container was handled makes me nervous. If you are, uh, if you are, I would say, aware of the specific place that you eat and you know how they handle, how they do things, I think it's probably okay uh, with warm, freshly cooked food. But I personally discourage it because of the fomite and the handling. Um, is there any way I can boost my immune system to fight this virus? Healthy lifestyle. Healthy lifestyle, meaning social distancing doesn't mean that we uh, close ourselves inside the house. We still can live a very active lifestyle. Uh, we can be taking walks. We can work out. Um, we can eat healthy. We have time to eat healthy now. Um, so I think... Um, try to not buy into the stress that an anxiety around it seek out to places that provide support and proper um information and living a healthy lifestyle there is no tonic or medication that i can say or multivitamin or a pill but i do think the 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 mental stress component the lifestyle component would go a long way um, in, in, in mentally fighting this, physically and emotionally fighting this um, pandemic. Can N95 masks be disinfected and reused if they are heated? Yes, yes, so we are in the process um, of, um, we are actually, our healthcare system is also 
looking at um, the UV light, which is a special level, uh, which is germicidal, is looking in trying to use the N95s. Um, it, it, obviously, this is a standardized process, but it is true and it is happening. So we can prevent um, um, you know, healthcare workers from getting sick and also patients getting sick because if one healthcare worker gets sick, they can expose many, many patients. So yes, that is true. Can you get COVID-19 twice? Does it mutate like the flu? So if you look at the studies, um, what has been done, what is described as reinfection in, um, in the Chinese uh, reports, what happens is immunocompromised patients, they tend to show the virus in their respiratory secretions for a very long time. So what is thought that the immunity would stay for four to five months, but then again, you can get the virus. But, but if you saw somebody got a swab today and they got infected today, and you repeated the swab in three weeks after, it's likely not reinfection. That is prolonged shedding. The immunity may stay for three to four to five months, but then you can get reinfected. Okay. So, so the, obviously there are vaccines with trials which are upcoming and are underway. We would know how long um, would it take for to find an efficacious vaccine. But the, the thought about reinfection, we have to understand prolonged shedding in immunocompromised patient followed by reinfection that may, comes, that may come months after. What are some of the potential treatments being studied for COVID-19 patients? For example, hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin. So hydroxychloroquine is being um, used um, in many institutions. There is um, the data regarding the azithromycin use in dual therapy is only a handful of patient, uh, patients. And so um, I do think that there is beneficial effect of hydroxychloroquine. Um, I am not in favor of combination therapy with azithromycin based on the data that has been presented. Um, there are trials for remdesivir available here in the US. Many institutions are struggling to get into the trials because of the limited sites availability. Um, the, the, there is a study, FDA approved to study the convalescent sera. We do know that the hypothesis is there. If this is efficacious or not, we do not know that. Um, would that be a therapeutic entity in the future? We do not know that yet. Um, we, there is some hypothetical risk of worsening lung infection with the convalescent sera. So, um, so that's a work in progress. What is convalescent plasma or convalescent serum? Convalescent serum is the immunity that the infected patient developed while they have the infection. What we do is you take away, take, take the, do the phoresis procedure on the patient who has recovered from COVID-19. You collect their antibodies and give it to the person who is currently infected with COVID-19. So the thought is that the convalescent serum has the antibodies against COVID-19 and would fight the COVID-19 in the currently infected patient. So that is the hypothesis. It has been done in other viral infections, um, but they're different. Most of the convalescent serum um, has not been studied in coronavirus situation. So this is a work in progress. And would it be beneficial? We do not know. I hope that it is. Um, are we currently instituting here in our um, system? We are exploring the current data to see whether this would be beneficial or not. Is tocilizumab a potential treatment for hospitalized COVID-19 patients? The comorbidity of mortality, comorbidity means the burden of infection of COVID-19 is because of this marked inflammatory response 
that comes within SARS-CoV-2 infection. So the body releases this huge surge of cytokines that attack all body systems, the heart, the lung, um, um, the, the kidneys, and the whole circulatory system. So similar situation is seen in patients who receive CAR-T because the body releases this huge surge of cytokines when they receive that product. Tocilizumab has been used for what we call cytokine release syndrome, CRS, um, in the CAR-T patients. There have been reports in, from China and then followed by China in Italy where tocilizumab was used in patients with severe pneumonitis um, associated with COVID-19. Interestingly, now there is data that also tocilizumab might be helpful in patients with myocarditis, means inflamed heart, with COVID-19. So what it points towards this COVID-19 causing this huge inflammatory response and tocilizumab being inhibitor of IL-6 receptor would prevent that from happening. That's the hypothesis. There are some early reports. We are, um, I do believe that there is a role of tocilizumab in, um, in COVID-19 and we are employing and currently uh, sketching up a criteria and guideline in our institution how to best use it. Is remdesivir a potential treatment for COVID-19? Remdesivir is an antiviral. It's an antiviral drug that has been used for um, with a specific antiviral activity, um, and it has antiviral activity against other viruses. It has been tested in a trial with good outcome in mild to moderate um, COVID-19 infection. Um, it is available. Um, it was available for compassionate use in the U.S. and also under clinical trial. Um, currently, it is in um, uh, expanded access program. It is slightly hard to get. Um, it would be my first choice if I were to treat a patient with mild to moderate COVID-19. The supply is definitely limited. I wouldn't say supply, the access is definitely limited. Um, and so it is an antiviral. Um, using remdesivir doesn't stop us from using tocilizumab, which is more towards the cytokine release uh, syndrome, and remdesivir is more uh, specifically an antiviral um, guide, uh, for, so aiming towards viral replication within the human body. If I'm a cancer patient with severe COVID-19, should I go to a research center hospital for better access to potential treatments? I would say yes. Uh, reach out to your oncologist and also trying to get to a bigger institution where there is access to clinical trials uh, would be um, the right thing, but remember that mild disease does not require treatment. So um, if you are doing well, this being having myeloma or any underlying malignancy, if you do have a milder disease, does not need treatment. Uh, however, if you feel like things are not moving in the right direction, there is increasing shortness of breath and you're feeling unwell, then trying to get to an institution um, where there might be potential clinical trials available would be the right thing to do. What over-the-counter medications should I have stocked in case I get a mild case of COVID-19? The main uh, treatment is going to be supportive care. Then what is, um, what is supportive care? Making sure that your body is hydrated. Making sure your temperatures are controlled. Currently, it is recommended to use acetaminophen, Tylenol, rather than an anti-inflammatory agent. The data is unclear about the anti-inflammatory agent. There was some suggestion that we should avoid anti-inflammatory agents such as Motrin, Aleve, Ibuprofen. Um, but at this time, I would recommend hydration, having enough supply of Tylenol, um, if you do develop a cough, making sure you have some cough medicine. Uh, but again, main, main emphasis would be on hydration and controlling temperatures with Tylenol.
If COVID-19 is seasonal and it leaves in the summer and comes back in the fall or winter, will we have a cure by then? I think treatment access would be better, but the vaccine is not going to be ready or efficacious. It takes a couple of years, honestly, um, to know what we do. And the, and the mutation, you have to always remember the virus mutates. When will things get back to normal or the new normal? There would be a new normal. And I, in my humble opinion, I think six to eight weeks at least, you have to give it time. And then the new norm would be a different norm. And it should be because we don't know what the temperature effect is going to be like for sure. And we know that then the temperatures are going to drop again. So we have to see how it goes. What other considerations should we keep in mind? What I would recommend, make sure that we take care of our mental health in, 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 in the current chaos, the news, um, the, 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 the information and the misinformation around it. Making sure taking time for self-care, making sure, finding that place where you are have um, have a free space to think would be very important um, so that we can we can come from a place of mindfulness um, from a base of tolerance for others, compassion for others, and compassion for ourselves.